what an opportunity to respond to Dr. Miroslav Wolf. I was very grateful to have the opportunity to have Miroslav as my Systematics three professor, one of his last quarters teaching here at Fuller. And in addition, I had the great honor of participating um, in one of his very large projects at the Yale Center for Faith and Culture on joy. Uh, so it is truly my joy to be here and responding uh, to Dr. Wolf. Um, Miroslav, I did want to say to you that not only has your work been really influential and inspiring to me, one of the things that I deeply appreciate about your work is that your th theology not only prods and challenges me, it's not only one in which I get to know more about God, but somehow the love of God seeps through your beautifully articulated words, spoken or written, in a way that I not only learn about God or know more about God, but I feel like I get to know God more. And somehow I feel more known by God. And this message that you just offered us provided me the same opportunity. Your message about God's homecoming is one that compels me to want to offer my life as part of this process of enabling this earth to be a place where God more fully dwells. Thank you. But I have one quick question. Did you not spend the last 18 months at home in quarantine? I thought homecoming was rather timely after being at home a long time. Well, all that said, my aim today is to offer a response to the cosmic vision that Miroslav has presented us and to bring that home, pun totally intended, to our current circumstances and to do so in such a way that offers a framework for how we think about the purpose of mission and the mission of the church especially how it relates to health, healing, and I will particularly emphasize thriving. I want to think with you a bit about what thriving is and why thriving. I also want to suggest that notions like thriving and flourishing and preparing God's home suggest a radical shift in how we envision and think about discipleship. At the get-go, I want to note that thriving is an invigorating and at times intoxicating word in English. As most of you know, Americans love growth. So anything that conveys or invites the idea of growth, people resonate with. I've seen that word go by on buses because it's often used for advertising. And I find my head not only following the bus and thinking, ah, thriving, I want that. But I know people often think, what does that exactly mean? And too often in America, thriving gets translated or seems to convey success or pursuit of happiness or individual well-being. But I want to challenge that today and offer a deeper thinking about thriving. I also know from my experience in research in the last few years in El Salvador and Rwanda, that thriving is not a word that is in all languages. I know in Spanish there are two words that come close, floreciendo and prosperando, and no, I am not fluent in Spanish. They come close to thriving, but they're not really thriving. So this is a newer idea, and I'm excited to think about it with you. So in his address on mission, Miroslav orients our attention towards the new Jerusalem, and the homecoming of God, and challenges the church to reimagine its mission is participating in the Spirit's continued work on earth in preparing God's home. In doing so, Miroslav offers a challenging and invigorating presentation of the gospel narrative 
by emphasizing consummation and fulfillment of creation as the telos of creation. It's the same gospel story we've been hearing in Sunday school, but there's an emphasis on where the story goes. He shifts our attention from Eden as the primary creation story to the New Jerusalem as the ultimate creation story. In doing so, he does not devalue Eden or our creation narrative, but rather by focusing on the book of Revelation and going back to the future, so to speak, he offers perspective on the significance of creation as the place of God's dwelling. So often, we don't quite get there or to that part of the gospel story. We go long on creation. We go really long on fall and sin and redemption and crucifixion. But we often don't get to consummation. It's important to note that his redaction on the eternal does not overshadow or undermine the material. But rather, this notion of homecoming imbues the material with inescapable significance, so much so that the weightiness of what he presents in the not yet realized of our eschatology has gravitational pull towards that end and actually draws us in or invites us in to full participation in the here and now in what God is doing to fulfill his creation. Miroslav's message of homecoming resonates with the pulse of a really important paradigm shift that is occurring right now. He shifts from our traditional at last, at least last couple hundred years orientation of leaving this world and escaping hell to engaging this world and focusing on where God dwells. Did you catch that shift? He pivots our attention from achieving unity with God by escaping this world to experiencing unity with God by engaging this world. Now, Miroslav, exclusion and embrace was a hit, but maybe there's a new book, Escaping and Engage. I'm not sure. But as Christians, we cannot be ones who are fo focused on escaping. All my psychological colleagues can tell you that denial is not how we grow. We need to be ones that are not focused on escaping, but ones focused on engaging. We cannot be ones who are focused on going back to Eden, going back to the garden, but we need to be ones who are focused on moving forward and pioneering towards the new Jerusalem. I find as Christians, we are often sentimental and look back and history is good and needed, but we need to be ones who continue to look forward, to look how God's spirit is moving and calling us forward and God's continued work of redemption and flourishing of this world. I find that often in the evangelical tradition, we are often more focused on what we are saved from, sin and death, which we should focus on and be celebratory of. But we also need to consider what we are saved for. And Wolf's message invites us into active engagement and participation in what we are saved for, the work of preparing this earth for God's dwelling. But I contend here in 2021, we are on the brink of something new. On one level, many of us are concerned at Fuller uh, that the church is breaking down. Our attendance is lower in mainline denominations. Especially after the pandemic, we struggle to know how to get people to engage and come to church. But I hope this season is a great opportunity, one in which is not a breaking down of church, but one is a breaking open of church. And I believe some of the insight into how that can occur 
was laid forth in Miroslav's message. When we become Christians who are motivated by what God is doing and how he is bringing redemption and consummation of our creation, and when we work and engage in the homecoming of God, we will be activated in a way that enables us to break open and bring our full selves to God's service. So with this shift in the idea on missions, I also contend that that means a different understanding of the Christian life, where we need a way of discipleship that corresponds with this telos or this vision of homecoming that he has given us. And I would say that in order to engage in preparing God's home and bringing God's creation to fulfillment, this deserves our full participation as full disciples of Jesus. I believe that if we are to be Christ's ambassadors, if we are God's workmanship, if we are called to offer our lives as living sacrifices, then we need to bring our full selves to the table. And bringing that fullness of self to the table, that is thriving. Thriving is becoming our full selves. Thriving is the process of growing into our full selves with and for God and with and for others. And this means full engagement. This means being fully connected to God, fully connected to others, and fully connected to ourselves. As an applied developmental psychologist, and if at times I've been called an applied theologian, I ask, how then shall we live? And towards what aim shall we live? Wolf has given us a a beautiful presentation of moving from Eden, perhaps it was a wrong turn at Babylon, but we're headed towards the new Jerusalem. Where are we headed as human beings? As a developmental psychologist, this is a question I ask. And I've offered, um, more fully developed in other places than I will have time to today, that potentially a telos or a goal or a purpose of human development is to become not individual autonomous selves, but rather reciprocating selves, selves that are fully engaged and fully connected with God and others. I draw on both a Christological and Trinitarian anthropology to talk about how as God's image bearers, we are called to grow more fully and enact the image of God. And as Christians, we know that Jesus Christ is the perfect image of God. And so as Christians, when we think about thriving, we can feel pretty comfortable with saying that we are called to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. We are all called as Christians to become more Christ-like. So there's something about thriving that has to do with our conforming to Christ. Now, I'll offer conformity often in the Christian world ends up being translated or enacted into behavioral conformity. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm I'm talking about being transformed and growing into modeling our life after the patterns and the character of Christ. But just as we are called to be conformed to Christ, we are called to do this as our unique selves. So there's a real distinction between conformity and uniformity. We are not all created to be the same and to live like Christ is the same. We are all called to live deeply into the fearfully and wonderfully made creations that God has made us to become. We are all to live like Jesus as ourselves. As much as we all want to be a lot like Miroslav, if we all were like Miroslav, the world would be in trouble. We all need different parts. And for many of us in ministry, we find great pressure to conform, to meet certain expectations. But I believe thriving actually lays more in becoming one's unique self, living into who you are. 
I saw a great birthday card at Romans that said, be yourself, everybody else is taken. I think there's some wisdom in that. And I want to pause on this because for Christians, this may sound really easy, this idea of being an authentic self. It's very popular in self-help books. But I also feel like for Christians, it feels blasphemous. We often think, oh, the cross is the symbol of Christianity, not an I. People should see Jesus, not me. And that is true. People should see Christ through us. But if our lives are to reflect glory to God, what if When we live with more clarity and integrity of who we are, then people might see more of God's light through us. This notion of thriving and living into one's authenticity challenges models of discipleship that do not celebrate the self. They also challenge models of discipleship that suggest that we should be full of ourselves. That's not what I'm talking about either. We are to become fully who we are, but fully for God's glory. The glory of God is humankind living and leaning into the fearfully and wonderfully made creations that we are. In thriving, so we're called to become conformed to Christ as our unique selves. And as much as we celebrate human uniqueness in thriving, we also acknowledge that thriving insists on relatedness. God created us to be in relationships with God, with humankind, and creation. As I said earlier, we are created to be reciprocating selves. We are created to be and live in that mutuality and attachment and belonging that Wolf talked about is quintessential to homemaking. In fact, we are formed in our relationships with others. We're not called to be renegade selves, developing to our fullest potential without regard to another. Um, Thriving is not individual success. It is not individualism run amok. But it is about participating with others to prepare the home of God. Thriving not only involves finding our own places of contribution, but in ministry, we serve and lead and tend to others to enable them to find their places of contribution. So taken together, thriving is a process. It is a journey. It is towards becoming our full selves with God, and for one another. Thriving occurs as we are more and more aligned with the intersection of those ovals. Thriving is also very aligned with what Irenaeus wrote. The glory of God is humankind fully alive. He did not write the glory of God is humankind fully stressed out. Nor did Irenaeus write, the glory of God is humankind trying to be someone they're not. Nor did he write, the glory of God is to publish or perish. I know this is digital, but can I get an amen somewhere for that from one of my faculty members? Some challenge this translation of Irenaeus and offer that it would be more accurate to translate his saying to, for the glory of God is a living person, and the life of a person occurs in beholding God. We become alive when we behold God. We become alive when God beholds us. It is a reciprocal engagement. When we are engaged with God, we grow into ourselves. Miroslav said that. He said, identity and mission are two parts of the same reality. This is so important because we understand our mission. We understand the church's mission when we come home to our identity as God's beloved. 
Sometimes within the Christ Christian tradition, you'll hear talk about coming home to God. And that when we come home to God's love for us and experience that security, that we will come home to ourselves. And this is absolutely true. There's attachment theory. There's a lot of psychology behind that statement. But I appreciate a twist that Miroslav offers us in preparing God's home. This emphasis points towards the importance of being proactive, that we are active agents in this homemaking process, that we can be intentional about living in this world in a way where we are making God's home, where we are making a home where we can be our full selves, where we can experience God's indwelling presence now. And that, in turn, allows us to live as our full selves. So we have to ask, what does this mean for the church? It means that we need models of ministry and mission that nurture healing and thriving, that enable those we lead to grow in their capacity to be themselves and to be reciprocating selves, where they are thriving where they're becoming their best selves with and for others. This is important because often within mental health, we aim to cure mental illnesses and get people back to baseline. People go to a doctor when they are sick to get healthy again. The image that Miroslav offers us has nothing with going back to baseline or returning to normal. The vision that he offers us is one that has to do with consummation in the flourishing of all creation. And I would contend that we need to enable people to thrive, to participate in that ongoing work. And thus, for those of us in ministry, we must ask, how do we serve? How do we lead? How do we tend to people for their physical mental, and spiritual health that loves them, affirms their worth, their unique strengths, and points out where they can contribute. We need models of thriving that bring out the best in each other. Given where my line of work has resulted, it's not surprising to me that since middle school, John 10.10 has been one of my favorite verses. I've often conceived of John 10.10 10 and the fullness of life that we have in Christ as being a blessing or a benefit of being a Christian. I think when I was younger, I thought, oh, if I live out the Christian life, if I behave, I'll have an abundant or full life. I thought about that differently as an adult. But as I was preparing this talk, I realized that we often do conceive of this fullness of life as a blessing or benefit. But I think we need to think about it as a mandate. God is not offering us abundant and full life because we behave or because we acknowledge God. I think God is inviting us, mandating us in to the fullness of life so that we can fully participate in his ongoing work as full persons in this world. I sincerely hope that the 2020s, or perhaps this millennium, will be known as an era where Christians stopped being motivated by escaping, not being motivated by a fear of hell, forgive me. But as a season of Christian history where we truly engaged God's spirit and work to enable this earth to be the place where God dwells. Let us engage wholeheartedly, wholebodedly in the spirit's ongoing work in the world. 
Let this era be known for a new vitality and vigor in our surrendering and participating in the work of the Spirit to bring God's creation to completion. Let us thrive as the fearfully and wonderfully made creations that God intended us to be. Let us be full of ourselves, not for our own ends, but for the fulfillment of God's creation and to prepare God's home here on earth. Amen. Amen.